Back in our first year in Elm Creek, Heather and I, a young married couple, before we had kids, uh, had two vehicles. Heather had this cute little nice red Nissan Sentra that got great fuel mileage and was just a nice little car. And I had an old 1975 F100 with a 460 engine. For those who don't know, that's a really big engine. It got terrible fuel mileage. Heather worked in Carmen at the Dufferin Credit Union, as it was called back then. And one day I said, could I please borrow the car? I was going to be driving down to Morden to meet the other youth pastors for lunch. And that old two-tone green truck, uh, which smelled like a dairy farm, because that's actually where I got it from, uh, just got such bad fuel mileage, I said, you know, it'd be better if you just drove it to Carmen, because I was going more than twice as far. She agreed. It was the first time she'd driven the truck herself. So later on, when we got home and had supper together, I asked, how'd you like the old truck? Sort of joking around. It was an old beater. And she said, you know, there's a couple of things I don't understand. It, it's not right. She said, you know, the steering, it's, it's so loose. And, and, and it bounced all over the place when I was driving down the highway, like all strange. And, and I think the speedometer might have been off because I was doing ni only 95 and I was passing everybody like they were standing still. Now, for those who don't know, what changed on speedometers between 1975 and 1976? Well, her speedometer that she was going by was only in miles per hour. And that's when I told her, 95? That's in miles per hour. And she looked at me and she said, well, how fast is that? Over 150 kilometers an hour. She was, oh, oh my. Well, maybe that's why the steering felt all loose and it was bouncing around so much. I want to read to you part of the verse before we have the scripture read to us right away. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but you do now. <laughs> well, that's sort of a joke. Heather wasn't looking to go speeding in the truck, but afterwards she did know better. Well, actually, she was doing much more of a favor for me when she did drive the truck. Today, we're going to read a passage that encourages us to grow in our faith as new believers. If you have your Bible, take time to open it up. We're going to be going through this word by word. And if you have a pencil handy, have it ready so you can underline and write in the margins. I'll be reading from 1 Peter, starting at chapter 1, verse 13 and reading through to chapter 2, verse 3. So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You, don't know, you didn't know any better then. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. And remember that the heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. But it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. And now in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. Through Christ, you have come to trust in God, and you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth, so now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart. For you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end, your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. As the scriptures say, 
People are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass, grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And that word is the good news that was preached to you. So get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. Now, I'm going to be going through verse by verse, chapter by chapter, the rest of this book. This sermon, I want to go through each verse, and we're going to stop at times when I think you might have questions to help clarify. So let's start off by reading verse 13. So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. I really like actually how it puts it in the NIV. It puts a word that is really important, therefore. The word therefore shows up twice in this passage in the NIV, both in this point, in verse 13, as well at the beginning of chapter 2. So when my Bible college professors said, you see the word therefore, you need to ask yourself, what is it there for? Therefore is telling us this is important, and here's the actions I want you to follow. So, Therefore, put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. What does the world tell us to put our hope into? Money. 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 Or it tells us to put our hope in the government. Or how about modern medicine? Now, don't get me wrong. The reason why we had Dr. Al Schrader share about vaccines this morning and that was because we had invited, I had invited and said, I really want your message to go out to explain a complex thing. I am so thankful for modern medicine. But my hope is not in medicine. I listen to my family doctor. I know that she is looking out for my best health interests. But my hope is not based on my doctor giving me eternal life. That is completely unrealistic. What I want from my doctor is to help me have the best quality of life that I can have here on earth so I can be the best possible worker for God while I am here on earth, so I can be a great husband, father, son, neighbor, pastor, and multiply worker. No, my hope needs to be in the work of Jesus Christ, not in the things of this earth. So you must live as God's obedient children. What does an obedient child look like? Well, it is not blind obedience. That is not a child. That is a robot. An obedient child asks questions, is engaged in learning, learning by doing. What is a disrespectful child? One that always says no. No to what is clearly being taught and asked. One that only thinks of themselves and not the rest of the family. One who thinks the world revolves around them. Obedient children ask questions, are engaged, they want to grow, and they're a joy to be with. This is what God wants from us when he says, be an obedient child. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. Now, I told that funny story about Heather with the truck. That was actually way more on me and my old truck than her. Let me tell you a story about a friend named Brad. Well, that's not his real name, but, but I want to protect his, pers uh, his, his uh, privacy. The story of how Brad came to Christ is crazy. A most unexpected story for another time. But I want to talk to you about three months into Brad's faith walk. Brad had gone through what I normally go through with new Christians. I always have them read the book of Luke 
and then Acts while we're studying this letter, 1 Peter. Why 1 Peter? Because it is written to a new Christian explaining to him or her, how do you live your Christian life? We had just gone through this. And now, three months later, because that's how slow we went through it together, we were into the book of Matthew. That's one of the next steps I take. Why? The Sermon on the Mount is just powerful. And we were in the midst of reading the Sermon on the Mount. I had told him to go home, read the specific passages I gave him, and then in a couple of days we'd come back together and we'd continue to study them. Well, it hadn't been an hour that I'd sent him away that he had come back to my office and said, Greg, 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 I need to talk to you about something. And I immediately knew the Holy Spirit was at, was at work and speaking into his life. I said, well, what, what's going on? He said, Greg, did you know that pornography is bad? Now, I stopped myself from laughing because, you know, of course, I'm, I'm the pastor. I also stopped myself from saying, wow, I can't believe I didn't teach him that already at this point. But God was at work. Here's what he had read, and, and I'm paraphrasing. Um, he had read that he should not lust after another woman who is not his wife. Because if he does so, he's committing adultery in his heart. See, he went home, read this passage with his wife. They'd only been married actually for a few weeks at that point. They'd been living together for many years before then. And he read this and he said, oh, the light bulb went on. He said, when I view pornography, you always got so upset and I never understood why. Is it because you feel like I'm committing adultery in my heart with her on the screen? And she looked at him and said, that's exactly how I feel. I, I didn't know how to explain it, but that's what I feel. And he went back to my office and said, Greg, we need to do something to protect myself and my family from pornography because it is not what God wants. Now, I don't want to say he never had a struggle with it ever again. No, of course not. This was a long, lifelong addiction at this point. But the starting point of recognition that it was sin was placed in his heart by God's word, and that was the first most important step in finding victory over this. So let's go on. But you must also, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. Wow, that is a tough concept to grab. Last week I taught you what hermeneutics meant. This week, I want to touch on the topic of holiness. Holiness is a word that we toss around in the church, from songs to Sunday school and now here at the pulpit. I do not expect for you to completely grasp the whole concept of holiness in this message, but I want to give you an analogy that helps you understand what holiness looks like, starting off with a metaphor of the sun. Not S-O-N, but S-U-N. The sun is unique in our solar system. It is really, really big, really powerful, and it is the source of all life on earth. So in a way, you can say the sun is holy. The area around the sun that is under the sun's sway is holy because it's under the influence of the sun. The gravity holds the planets in its place. Its heat gives life-giving power to life on earth. We would have no life on earth if we didn't have the sun. But the problem is, what happens when you get too close to it? You see, the sun is very good and very powerful, but it is also very dangerous. If you get too close to it, it will annihilate you. There's a satellite called the Helisphere Observatory that is the spacecraft that gets the closest to the sun. It's the closest any man-made object has ever gotten. It's on a big oval that it sort of goes around the sun where, where once every 58 days it gets really close to the sun. And it only does that for a short time. And when it is that way, it's being protected by the most resilient ceramics that humanity has ever made. And they still expect it to only last for a few more years. It's only been up for seven or eight years. They said it'll last at the most a decade. The sun, which gives power and life to our solar system is so powerful it will destroy the most hardy sp spacecraft ever made by humanity. It is a life-giving force 
that if you come too close to it, it will destroy you. In the same way, there's a paradox of God's own holiness. If you are impure, his presence is dangerous to you. And when you have sin, you're impure. It is not because he is bad. It is because his holiness is so good. This is the image that the prophet Isaiah saw as recorded in Isaiah chapter 6. When Isaiah sees the bottom of God's robe, he is terrified. He cries out that he is certain he is about to be destroyed. And then this crazy-looking angel, as is described, called a seraphim, which covers his face with special wings and feet with special wings, flies over because it's protecting itself from God's holiness because it's close up, sort of like that shield on, on that spacecraft that I was talking about. And it flies over with a hot coal to Isaiah and touches his lips and sears them. And then says, your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. That burning coal transforms its purity to Isaiah so he can stand in God's holy presence. God is the one who transfers his holiness to creation. Another image that comes to my mind for holiness is the vision of Ezekiel in the chapter 47 of the book named after him. He sees a vision of a stream of fresh water flowing out of the temple. That holy fresh water flows through the desert and gives life to the land all around. Eventually that flow of water flows into the Dead Sea. And even the Dead Sea, which is so filled with salt, is filled with fish and trees all around it and it comes to life. So instead of us going into God's presence of the temple, God's holy presence flows out of the temple, making everything pure and giving life. And then we have Jesus show up. Jesus is our ultimate example of what holiness looks like in the flesh. Jesus claims to fulfill all these ancient visions in surprising new ways. He claims he is the embodiment of God's holiness in human form. In his earthly ministry, he goes around and touches impure people like lepers, and they're physically healed. He casts out unclean spirits from people, and they receive freedom. He touches the blind, and they can see. He sits with sinners, unclean people by society standards, and they're transformed. The book of Matthew is written by one of those unclean sinners, the tax collector, the worst of the worst. Jesus is like the stream of fresh water coming out of the temple. Jesus claimed that he was God's holiness and that he and his followers would become the temple of God and through them, God's holy presence would go out into the world and bring life, healing, and hope. By the way, this is why Jesus describes himself and his followers as having streams of living water flowing out from them. There's so much more to talk about this holiness and this new vision of a temple, but that's actually next week's sermon. I'm going to go on. That's my introduction to holiness, which will permeate this book. Verse 17. And remember that the Heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. Good parents do not show favoritism. Now, we know from stories all throughout the Old Testament of parents showing favoritism. And we all know, as we heard in the Joseph series, that did not work out very well. Now, the great thing about God is, he still redeemed those relationships that came out of broken families and used those people to bring hope to all nations, to save so many like he did with Joseph. But God wants us to follow his example of what a perfect heavenly father looks like. And that is to not show favorites. And remember, God does not command us to do this so in order that we can be saved by our own good works or that we're good enough to be called the people of God by our own deeds. He does this rather to give us a full life. He wants us 
to have a life that reflects how he looks so that we can be that life-giving presence to those around us. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. So, what does it mean to have reverent fear? This is a concept our modern society does not have nor wants to have. It is actually seen as a negative thing in our society to have reverent fear. Remember what I said last week in, when we talked about hermeneutics? One of the temptations is to see something that our culture says is bad. And when we read it in Scripture, we say, well, that was really for the first century. This is one of those examples. Reverent fear is a good thing. It is something that we need to have. Let me give you the explanation of why. Reverent fear is the root of the most important wisdom that we all seek according to the Bible. Many years ago, I took a course in wisdom literature here at CMU with Pierre Gilbert. He stated there were three types of wisdom in life. Wisdom number one, you know how to do your job well as a teacher, a plumber, a lawyer, an electrician, a surgeon, a pilot, etc. You know your job well. Wisdom number two is you know how to run your life day to day well, like take care of your finances, raise your family, get along with your neighbors, live at peace with each other. Wisdom number one is good. Wisdom number two is so much better and so much more important. We all know people who are great at wisdom number one, who have made lots of money, but they've been terrible at wisdom number two and their life is a mess. But in God's kingdom, wisdom number three is even more important. What is wisdom number three? It is understanding God's ways for your life and in the life of others around you. According to the Bible, this is the greatest wisdom, and you can only have that if you have reverent fear of God. What does reverent fear look like? Looking at, it, looking at God with awe. Recognizing that holiness, that power, where all life comes from, yet if we get too close, we feel like we might get burnt up. This reverence. In our society, we've lost that. That is something that we need to yearn for, is that reverence. Temporary residence. Remember last week, I told us, as we started in, off in this book, heaven is our ultimate destination, that it is real. I know many refugees, and they completely understand so much better than we do what it means to be temporary residents. When they set up in a refugee camp, they know this is only where they're going to be temporarily. Or at least they hope they are and they expect to be. They know that they'll be moving on. Now, this doesn't mean that they don't build a house or a church. They do those things. But they hold to things very differently than we do here in Canada. When we build our dream house that we expect to live in for the next 50 years. Now, please, I'm not knocking. I'm just saying when we put down our roots and plan for our future, we need to be reminded that this is not our final destination. When you look at life this way, you don't hold on so tightly to the physical things of your life. You're so much more open to be generous with your possessions. From loaning out your car, to letting people stay in your house, or your tools, and so much more. This change in perspective is so important for followers of Jesus to have. It truly changes the way that we look at things. Now Peter goes on to remind the readers of what they have said yes to. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life that you inherited from your ancestors. That's our culture around us. The empty life that culture just have enough stuff, more stuff. That's an empty life. It was not paid for with mere gold or silver, which loses its value, but with the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chooses, chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now, in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. 
Now, there's so many things to talk about here. Um, just one of the ones. The, the whole idea of, of the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb. If you don't know your Old Testament, you will not understand what it's talking about. I've actually heard people over the years in, in every church I've served in, why do I need to know the Old Testament? I just want to know about Jesus. If you don't know your stories in the Old Testament, you will have no idea what Jesus talks about that he's fulfilling. Why he even came. The whole concept of us understanding how sin messed up a perfect creation comes from the book of Revel- uh, from Genesis. For Exodus, it explains the blood of the Lamb, the spotless Lamb of God. If you don't understand where this falls into the story of Passover, you will be lost. It is so important for us to be delving into the Word, both the Old and the New Testament. And our goal as a church is to teach how to read these in the right literary sense. And this plan was revealed to us through the work of Jesus Christ. Verse 21, Though Christ, Through Christ you have come to trust in God. You have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. Jesus paid it all. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. How did you obey the truth? You confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart. So now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all of your heart. Love. Again, that's a subject that will come up again later on in detail in this book. For you have been born again, not to a life that will quickly end, but your life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. A life that is eternal, born again. Last week I talked about heaven being a real place that Peter fully expected followers of Jesus to go because he literally saw Jesus rise from the dead and then ascend into heaven. Heaven is not a figure of speech. It is our ultimate end goal and the place that we will be. It is our ultimate home. Again, when we have that in mind, it helps us to hold on to the things, the physical stuff of life, loosely. So, with that mentality, what are the things that we should hold on to? Well, I want you to look around at the people around you right now. People. We need to hold on to people the way that God wants us to hold on to people. Why? Because they are eternal when they have been born again. See, people are born with a soul that is not going to ever be destroyed because we are made in God's image. People have two places they'll be going at the end of time, after we die. They'll either be going to heaven or hell. So the people beside you, do you know that they're eternal? And if they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and are born again, they will spend eternity in heaven with Jesus and you'll be with them. So the people are eternal. But now look around you again. Your house, it will be gone someday. My house is about 60 years old. It could be burnt up in a fire and gone tomorrow. I'm pretty certain my home will not be standing in 100 years. People are eternal. The stuff around us will be burnt up in the flames someday. This is why Peter reads this following passage. The scriptures say, People are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord remains forever. When we have the word of the Lord residing us and we're born again, we remain forever with him. This is from Isaiah chapter 40, that same prophet that saw the hem of God's robe that we talked about before. And that word is good news that was preached to you. Amen. And now the most practical thing that we'll learn today. Chapter 2, verse 1. So get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and unkind speech. The NIV once again uses the word therefore. This is the second time we see therefore in this passage. This is the great starting point for what God wants for us in our faith walk after we've turned and followed him. 
If you're a new believer of Jesus, this is what he wants from you. To get rid of deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and unkind speech. That is what God wants from you. Not a list of do's and don'ts. Not a list of now follow this and do all this. He wants us to walk with integrity. Why? Because that is how he is. And that is what brings life to the, those around us. Verse 2. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have the taste of the Lord's kindness. So what is the milk of our faith? To grow in our faith, we need to be doing three things. One, study the Word of God. That is literally what we are doing right now. What I'm training you to do as you read your Bible together right now. That's why we learn about words like hermeneutics. Why we learn about words like holiness. Why we learn about reading different genres of Scripture. One of my goals as a pastor is to enable you to go home, well, you are home, open up your Bibles and say, I now know how to read this for myself. And then you do it. One of the greatest things I could ever hear from somebody is, I can't wait to read Scripture for myself. And then they do it. And they learn. And they come back to me and say, this is what I learned like my friends that I talked about earlier. Second, prayer. Prayer, both a personal prayer and corporate prayer. Prayer is the lifeline between us and God. It is how we communicate directly with the creator of the universe. This too is spiritual milk that we need to be taking in. We'll be talking about prayer more in this letter later on as well. And community, fellowship, and worship. We are called to worship together. Now, this is one of the things that's been so hard during the pandemic. Now, it is a good tool, and I'm so thankful for it, that I can speak to you over the internet on Facebook, and and if you're watching later on on YouTube. What a great tool, but, but it doesn't meet the needs of us gathering together. Being in each other's presence encourages us. Worshiping together empowers us. We feel the Holy Spirit moving through us when we sing together. This is something that when the time comes, I want to encourage you. Do not neglect meeting together. This is part of our faith growth. In our church, When we're together, this is how we hold each other accountable. How we encourage each other when we're down. How we understand the commands that are confusing to us when we read them in Scripture. All three of these are equally important in our nourishment as followers of Jesus. A Christian who only reads the Word of God is in danger of making it only head knowledge. A Christian who only meets with fellow Christians is in danger of just being part of a social club. A Christian who only prays in private is in danger of being a hermit who doesn't interact with society and cannot be part of the life-giving change that God wants to bring to the world. Think of these as the three essential food groups for maturing Christians. When people come to me and say they don't feel like they're growing in their faith, I ask them these three questions often. Are you in the Word and are you understanding what you're reading? Are you praying on your own and with others? Are you in community with other Christians, eating with them, walking with them, worshiping with them, serving with them? All three of these things are essential to grow. And that's my so what. But here's the good news. God is at work in you. He is transforming us. And he has, as we're reminded twice in this passage, the eternal hope of salvation and standing in his presence in heaven. Because that is our final destination. Next week, we will grasp or try to grasp the concept of what it means 
to be a holy temple of God. Because this is just a building. But we are the new temple of God. And how? He brings about salvation to all the world through his temple. Let me bow for a word of prayer. Lord, may we be encouraged by this passage to continue forward in our growth. A growth that you want for us because you want us to live life to the full. You want us to be a sweet aroma. You want us to live at peace with those around us. And you want us to be transformed into your image. Thank you that you gave us your example here on earth and as it's recorded in Scripture. May we walk away encouraged to do those three things that are the spiritual milk. To read your word, to pray to you, and to fellowship and worship together. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.